Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, she was kind enough to come back onto the podcast. We've got breaststroking extraordinaire, Emily Escobedo. Hi. I don't know. For, from from my view, you had a pretty spectacular weekend in Richmond. Um, what did you think of your of your meet at the Pro Swim? Yeah, I was really happy with um, my results. I mean, I kind of coming off the ISL season and going some best time short course meters. I was hoping to be, you know, somewhere in ballpark range, um, but it's always hard to tell. Like first long course meet in a year, probably since last um, January or February. So. Um, I didn't have super high expectations going in. Um, and I, and I don't train long course ever. So, um, that was kind of like the first long course situation I had going on, but I love swimming like long course breaststroke. It's like my favorite thing. So I always can transition into it pretty quickly and smoothly. Um, so yeah, overall, I was really, really happy with my results. Did you have any expect kind of expectation heading in, um, especially once you got the prelim swims down, which, you know, obviously I like ISL didn't have, were you kind of thinking, okay, I think this is where I could be tonight in the hundred and the 200. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It was definitely weird swimming prelims and finals again. Cause ISL was just, it was honestly so nice just having to swim once. Um, so it's going to take some time to get back into that. Um, but yeah, after the prelim swim, you know, I just wanted to like put together a pretty solid race. Um, and then at, at, in finals, I just tested a little bit more, put a little more effort into the, especially like with the 200 gone out a little bit faster and, and just wanted to see if I could hold on. So I was able to do that pretty well. So I was happy with it. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I think it has to be said, uh, you topped Lily King in both the hundred and 200 breaststrokes, uh, which, you know, a little surprising it's, it's January, everyone's in a different place, but that was especially in the 200, like by two seconds. Um, I mean, what did you make of, of coming out on top in, in the combined results? I think it's, um, definitely pretty hard to make a comparison because, you know, things are different when you're actually there racing, um, so I was not racing Lily. We were in two separate meets. Um, I just happened to put up faster times and I think there are so many things that can contribute to that. Um, but no, it was, it was definitely like a confidence boost moving forward. Um, you know, it was the best time for me in the hundreds. So that's all I kind of look for is like best times. It's like, I've just slowly been trying to figure out how to swim the hundred over the past few years and 10th by 10th, I've gotten a little bit faster every time I swim, which is really nice. Um, obviously she is way faster in that event. So no comparison there, but, um, I was just happy to have some good times. I was happy with my 200. Um, that's kind of where I shine a little bit more where I'm able to, you know, hit or miss. I'm able to win sometimes. So, um, yeah, I was definitely happy with it. I didn't realize that was the best time in the hundred. Congratulations. Yeah. By like two or three tenths. It's like every, almost every time I swim, I've been working on the hundred so much because I used to really only be able to swim the 200. And I was like, okay, you know, if I'm getting top three in the 200, I got to be able to make at least semifinals or finals <laughs> in the hundred, you know? So I had to start um, like slowing it down and focusing on that a little bit more. So now I kind of every once in a while when I'm swimming and I'm feeling good, I drop little bits at a time, little bits at a time. So I mean, the best is the best. So I'm really happy with it. Yeah. How, how have you been able to focus on the hundred it maybe just in the past few months? Yeah, just doing a little bit more speed work. Um, I think putting on some muscle, getting a little bit stronger helped a lot with that. Um, in my 200, I rely a lot on my glide, um, and focus more on, you know, distance per stroke and technique than necessarily speed. Um, and I always had a problem when I tried to convert that you know, long stroke into a faster, higher tempo stroke, I would always slip in the front. So just doing a lot of breaststroke pull, focusing a lot on technique and just building in speed as you go has helped a lot. Do you have, is there, is there a different technique for the hundred and the 200, or is it just kind of altering that technique from the hundred to the 200? Yeah. I don't think I changed my technique very much. I think it's just 
a little bit faster tempo trying to, you know, hit the glide and still get into like a good line. But as soon as you get there, you kind of have to be ready to start the next stroke. Um, and it's been a struggle for me because I really, I like to take very long strokes. I don't know. I think it makes it easier for me. Um, and it's frustrating because sometimes, you know, the harder I try and the more I, more strokes I take, the slower I go. So I've kind of had to find that rhythm and, and like that perfect place between, you know, really long and gliding and just trying to take really powerful long strokes and trying to gain a little bit more speed as well. It's like a sweet spot yeah. in the middle. So I'm yeah. Starting to figure it out. <laughs> Um, take me, take me through these last couple months for you, you know, since coming off of ISL, what has training looked like in, in that period during ISL or after, uh, sorry. So like between ISL and this pro swim. Okay. Yeah. So, um, ISL was so fun just having the opportunity to train and, and compete against, you know, the best swimmers in the world. We were all together. It kind of like I feel like for a lot of us, it kind of like reinvigorated our love for the sport, you know, it's just such a fun experience. And then coming off that, it's always a little bit harder, especially for me, because I train with, you know, a club team, I don't train with pros, um, and practice times are not ideal, especially now. Um, so it was definitely an, an adjustment coming back. Um, but we've just tried to kind of keep everything from ISL going, you know, I feel like I learned a lot while I was there, both technique wise and just about my body and what I need. Um, and so we've kind of just taken that and continued to roll with it, um, throughout these past couple months. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what do you feel like has, has worked for you in training these past couple of months? What is, what has it been like? Um, well, training has been a little bit weird. Um, like I said, because of COVID. So I swim, um, 7 30 to 9 AM and then I swim 7 15 to 9 15 PM. Um, so it's, there's like more time during the day between my doubles than there is overnight. Like it's a very weird dynamic, which I'm not really used to. So I've kind of had to adjust to that since being back. Um, we've just focused on trying to maintain what like the growth that I had in ISL. So maintaining that technique, um, also throwing in a little bit more of an aerobic capacity going into long course. Um, like I said, I don't train in a long course pool, but doing a little bit more aerobic and a little bit more, you know, breaststroke pace and maintaining all of that to try and prepare for long course the best that we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, I mean, let's, let's just keep backing it up. You said you, you grew, you learned a lot. You took a lot away from ISL. Uh, it seemed, it seemed, it certainly reinvigorated the swimming community. I felt yes. reinvigorated at the end of ISL. Um, so, I mean, let's dig into that going into the ISL season two in Budapest. How are you feeling about where you were at racing wise? Um, going into it, it was, I mean, that was the first time we had raced since February and some people, you know, pools space was all confusing, especially those first few months during COVID. So, um, I felt like I was really strong. I felt like, um, aerobically I was doing really well because that's all we had been doing was practicing, but I wasn't really confident in race shape per se. Um, so just being back there, I think, I think the first meet, I was just so excited to race again that it was just like no pain, just, everything you got because this is the first time you race. And at that point, you know, we were all just so thankful to be back and be in a regular competition. Um, and then moving forward from there, I think I performed pretty well the first meet and I just kind of wanted to slowly, you know, get the ball rolling and try to improve a little bit more, a little bit more, um, which I was able to do. So it was a lot, it was a lot of fun racing. Yeah. Did, did you lose in the 200 breast at all this season? Um, yeah. For sure. Is that for sure? Did you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, so, uh, okay. So overall, were you, what, what do you feel like you gained from those five, you were in semifinal number one, right? So five, yeah, five weeks, yeah. Five weeks of racing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it was definitely difficult for a lot of us because, because of the fact that we hadn't raced in so long. Um, and then having, you know, meets back to back, like three, four days apart sometimes, um, was definitely a struggle. I think 
it helped a lot prepare us for kind of like a prelims final scenario in a way, because you were racing, you know, a Saturday, Sunday, and then you raced again, Wednesday, Thursday, we had like a really close back-to-back meet. So it was a lot of just race prep, getting ready, getting hyped to race. Um, and I mean, I love racing with a team like college swimming was my favorite because it wasn't about like you, you know what I mean? It's about, it's about the team and, and it's about how many points you can put up for the team. And that just like makes it all so much more worth it. So. Yeah. I, I, I can certainly see how, yeah, the team environment would really easily sweep you up and get you excited for racing. I mean, it was so, it's such an interesting scenario of, like you said, two days on, two days off, two days on. Wh- how did you adjust training wise, uh, in that circumstance? Yeah, it was definitely weird because like I said, we hadn't been used to it for a while. I kind of, I felt like I really enjoyed that, like like really high intensity for a couple of days and then taking a couple of days to just, you know, float around in the pool, um, and just focus on technique and just like a little bit of yardage, but not getting too high and then get up and race again. I seem to have performed pretty well during that period. Um, and I think because your body finally adjusted to just racing all the time, you know, so instead of, you know, getting pummeled in practice, doing five K six K just fully drained, it's like a different type of hard where you're really, really tired and it's really hard, but it's quick sprints. And then you have a lot of time to kind of recover and a lot of easy swimming after that. So I was able to perform pretty well, better than I expected to, um, in those like back-to-back race days, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And especially when you're, you know, taking it easy, uh, in between those hard sets, um, I mean, what are you doing outside the pool to make sure you're re- you're race ready? Yeah. So we were doing like physical therapy and rehab and stuff like that. We had, um, amazing massage therapists on the New York breakers that were taking care of us. So we got to get worked on, um, pretty much whenever, every couple of days, whenever we deemed necessary, they kind of cycled through the whole team, which was incredible. Um, so we had a lot of support physically and mentally, Um, and then just, you know, loosening, trying to have fun with the team, you know, bonding, I think helps a lot in performance because once you kind of get to know everybody, you just really want to work hard for them. So we did a lot of team bonding. Um, the Island itself was beautiful. So we weren't stuck inside the hotel all the time. We were allowed out and we were allowed to walk the Island. So just getting that fresh air and like taking a little mental health break was really beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, that that was my next point is just from the mental and emotional side of things. You know, it's it's an interesting situation. You're back in swimming and I, you know, a lot of people said they were really grateful just to get back into racing, get back into swimming <laughs> regularly. Um, you know, knowing that you have pool time, but also, you know, you're in a room by yourself. Um, you might not have as much social interaction as like a normal swim meet or like in season 1 when you were with the team all the time. Um, so how did that spectrum of emotions kind of hit you and and how do you deal with that? Yeah. In the beginning, it was, um, really nerve wracking because, um, first of all, we needed like COVID tests to be back and to be negative before we even left. Um, but some of us, a lot of us actually had trouble getting on the first flight because our airport had different information than what we were given. So what we were told we needed to leave and go to Hungary our airport did not agree with. So it was like a fight just to get on the, on the plane. It was Mm -hmm. terrifying. I was fighting with the kiosk desk for like an hour and a half before they let me through. And I don't know if they let me through because they just felt bad for me or if they realized they were wrong or, or what happened there. Um, so just, just that kind of stress, just getting there was really stressful the first couple days. And then we had to stay in our hotel room until, we had another negative test once we had arrived um, and everything I feel like was, you know, I still did a great job putting everything together, but I think because of COVID, everything was kind of put together a little bit last minute. So we didn't have like a distinctive plan. We didn't know exactly what was going on in those first few hours, first few days upon arrival. So that was really stressful. But, um, you know, once we got out of that, we were able to you know, get out of our quarantine in our room um, and meet our team and just start getting into the swing of things and going to the pool and being and having access to the weight room. I think 
Um, it was, it was really great. And I think it honestly helped a lot because, um, I was lucky I had been training, um, before I left for ISL, I had pretty, not perfect pool times. I mean, I was swimming eight to 10 PM, which was awful, but I still had, you know, a two hour training block. So even though I was falling asleep the last hour, I was, I was still thankful to be swimming. So for a lot of other people, they didn't have that kind of access to a pool before they came to ISL. So they weren't in the best shape and they kind of had to push to get back in shape. And I think as a whole, you know, the whole ISL, the whole dynamic and the culture just helped us all get back into shape, get back into racing shape and kind of, you know, establish some sort of normalcy in non-normal times. Yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot, there's a lot of uh, long course training as well. Were you pleased about that? Yeah. I mean, definitely the first, the first couple of practices, like aerobic free long course were awful, but, um, <laughs> I wanted to use the long course pool as much as possible just because I don't have access to a long course pool back home. Um, and being able to train and race long course, um, especially breaststroke definitely, you know, changes the way you swim a little bit and it affects you a little bit differently. Um, so I tried to take advantage of the long course pool as much as possible. Yeah. Nice. When you hop at a long course pool and you're starting to do, you know, get your breaststroke warmed up. Um, like you said, you, it's not something you normally do. You normally don't train long course. What's the, what is there like a first thing you try to focus on in terms of those little stroke changes? Yeah, I do a lot of just like elongation drills. So just a lot of like long glides, distance per stroke, different types of drills to just get into body line a little bit better. Um, I always kind of have to ease into long course with breaststroke because I have like hip and groin injury. And, you know, if I do too much too fast because you don't have those turns and you're not pushing off off the wall, you're not getting a break. It's just constant breaststroke kick. Um, it sometimes gets a little bit sore. So I definitely have to take it a little bit easier and kind of play with it and figure out, Mm -hmm. you know, when I can start pushing and when I need a little bit of a break, but, um, for the most part, sure wise, it ends up working out pretty well. Nice. Uh, and so that, so then after ISL, one more ISL question, uh, is, was there a highlight for you? Was there a race that stood out or a moment that stood out, um, that you will definitely remember from ISL season two? Um, I I don't know if it's just like a specific moment, but we, well, I guess it kind of is. We had um, Peter Timmers um, on our team and the, the, the point of ISL for me that I loved so much was just bonding and getting to know the team Um, and making new friends. And it really showed true when, you know, we all had like this big retirement, um, like party type thing for Peter. Um, And it was just, you know, all people from all different cultures and all different countries coming together to, you know, celebrate and congratulate this one, you know, icon in swimming. Um, And it was just, it was really fun. I mean, it was a bittersweet moment. It's not like I had known him for long or had even, you know, known of him for very long, but just the fact that we all came together so quickly um, and we grew so close so fast in those five weeks. um, It's pretty spectacular. That is cool. And that was certainly seemed like a really cool culmination of, like you said, that team bonding and and what the ISL is, is kind of really all about. Yeah. Of course. Um, so you get home from ISL and it, I think it was early December. Uh, your coach sent us this video of you going 205 in practice. Yeah. Uh, t- tell me about that. Yeah. So we have the, um, I mean, USA Swimming put together that leaderboard thing um, to try and, you know, encourage us to continue to race. Um, and because of how I was performing in ISL, I figured, you know, keep racing and keep doing these events because they've been going pretty well. So I suited up one morning at practice. Um, I actually ended up doing three suited swims. I did that in the morning and then I did another one short course meters at night. And then I did another one the next day to try and simulate trials. Um, and I was really happy. It was, um, definitely hard. It took a toll on my body swimming 300, three, 200 breaststrokes, but it was fun. Okay. I was going to ask about that. Cause he sent us that video and he was like, so this is like prelims and then we might do two others. Um, so let's start with the, the prelim swim. So you, you went two Oh five, five, it's three tenths off your lifetime best of two Oh five, two. Um, you know, it, that being the prelim swim, what was, what were you thinking? What was your mindset heading into that swim? Um, yeah, I was really happy with it. Um, 
mindset was, I mean, it was really early in the morning. I just wanted to try and put up a good race. Um, and I was swimming alone, which is definitely hard, but I wanted to take what I learned in ISL and kind of, um, push forward and try and make an adjustment. I mean, I worked a lot on my pullout, um, when I was out there and just like a lot of little technique things that I think I, you know, was able to make, make some adaptations to my breaststroke, just some growth, little things. Um, so just kind of continuing, you know, that ability to race and maintain that good technique throughout the, throughout the race. Yeah. And then two Oh five, five, were you pleased with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially, you know, given it was, it was eight o'clock in the morning and, (laughs) um, it was just like a random day. Um, I was definitely pleased with it. Yeah. It'd be fun to, you know, be able to race short course yards and finals once, but I mean, we, we don't really swim much short. I mean, I train short course yards, but I feel like I don't race short course yards that much. So it was definitely fun. Nice. And so then, uh, yeah, I was excited to ask you about this and and see if it actually happened, but moving on to semifinals, you said it was short course meters. How did that swim go? It was good. It was, um, two twenty, like high, I think. So, um, I was hoping to be a little bit faster, um, just based on what I had gone short course yards in the morning, but, um, definitely a solid swim. I was happy with it. And then the following day at finals, I did it again, or sorry, the following day I simulated like a final swim the next night. It was also short course meters. Um, and I dropped like 0.6 or 0.7. So it was still 220, but it was 220 low. So gotcha. pretty solid. I mean, um, it wasn't obviously not as fast as any of my ISL swims, but considering I feel like I was, you know, 220 starting last season's ISL. So to be able to do that kind of in practice, I was, I was happy with. Yeah. And I mean, it was, was the point of it just to kind of simulate the swim itself or did you take it pretty seriously throughout the day and kind of, you know, obviously you're simulating Olympic trials, but did you go through a similar race routine, warm ups, stuff like that as well? Yeah, I kind of have like a like a set race warm up that I do or something similar that I kind of adapt based on what I'm feeling. Um, so I did do the warm ups and everything. I mean, I didn't, you know, just like hang out in a hotel or a room all day. It's still like regular <laughs> life. But um, yeah, I tried to simulate it as best as I could. I mean, obviously the nerves and the excitement and the energy wasn't there, but um, just trying to get a few races in. I think we'll probably do that once or twice more. Um, leading up to trials as well. Yeah. Nice. I mean, that's, that's a really cool thing that you're able to do. And also just a a great strategy of kind of getting those rapes race reps in without any meets, obviously. Yeah. I think it's definitely hard, especially, you know, going from ISL where you only swim, you know, once it's just, everything's timed finals and then building into just a few meets long course where we're going to have the ability to swim prelims and finals. And then just to, you know, assuming trials is, is the same as it has been in the past, just like hop right into trials, um, and have to swim the event three times, depending on what event you're doing. It's kind of a big, a big leap. Um, so I'm just trying to ease my way into it. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> um, so we mentioned your best yards time was two Oh five, two. I think that was from your senior year in CAAs. Yeah, probably. Um, and see, I mean, since then, it seems like you've just continued to improve and improve, um, especially in long course swimming. Do you feel like in these last few years, I guess, as a, as a professional, um, you've really honed in on what works for you in training? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, it's something that's really, it's really hard to do because everybody trains differently. Um, and what might work for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. Um, and for so long, I was always, you know, I, I, I mean, I still feel guilty if I don't go to practice or if I take a morning off. Um, but it's kind of trying to figure out what works and trusting your body and listening to your body and what your body needs, you know, um, in the past or before, you know, these past few years, I feel like, no matter how tired I was, I was finishing that practice. I was going to give it a hundred percent and that's still the case, except now I kind of listen to myself and my body and my coach and I kind of, you know, watch how things are going. And if, if I'm totally bombing a set and I'm just exhausted and my body's tired, then there's really no reason to keep going. It's just gonna, you know, I'm just digging myself a deeper hole 
that I'm going to have a harder time recovering from. So I think I've learned a lot about recovery. Um, you know, rolling out, I used, I mean, I still hate rolling out, but I used to hate it even more. Now I really forced myself to do it. Um, doing a lot of physical therapy and rehab for like minor injuries that I have, um, is something that's new to me as well. I didn't necessarily do before, but, you know, taking the time to do that and making sure that I'm just, you know, when I'm, when I'm at practice and I'm, I'm able to give, you know, as much as I can give, but I try not to push past the the boundaries of what I can give because then, you know, the rest of the week is kind of just, it's screwed, you know? Yeah. And I think uh, especially talking to pro swimmers or swimmers out of college, you, you, you get, as, as swimmers are starting to age more and more, you, you kind of get that sense that it's much more important to kind of know your threshold or yeah. get accustomed to that threshold. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in college, <laughs> you just like didn't take a practice off. And I mean, I still very rarely do I skip a practice, but like if I am exhausted and I don't feel well, then me waking up to drag myself to a practice where I know I'm mentally and physically not there is going to do more harm than good. So just kind of being able to be confident enough to address that and, and, you know, listen to it is something that's definitely new to me that I've been working on. Yeah. Do you, I, with, with, with this level of improvement or growth that you've had throughout your career so far, um, I, do you ever, think about if this would have come earlier in your career, how it might've differed your path or are you? Yeah. Question. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know really. Cause I think the older you get, um, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I get more tired and practices are harder sometimes. Um, and maybe when I was a little younger, I just had all the energy. I didn't really need to do that, but I think, um, everything kind of serves a purpose. You know, I think, you know, in high school, it's important in college, it's important to, you know, figure out how to swim through that, that pain and, and to be exhausted and to still be able to swim through it. Um, because it's not, again, it's not just about you. It's kind of about your whole team. And if you don't show up, then your, why, why is the rest of your team showing up? You know, everyone is working together for a common goal in a way. Um, and now that, you know, at post-college and I'm pro, um, things are a little bit different. This is my career and it's something that I love to do. Um, but I also need to, you know, focus on myself and make sure that I'm doing what's right for me instead of what I'm, what I'm doing, what's right for the whole team. Yeah, that, sense. that does make sense. And I, I think uh, it's all like a learning curve. You know, I think you have to go through, I think everybody goes through it, you know, where you just, you feel like you need to swim 6,000 yards a day and you, or 6,000 meters a day. And you feel like you need to, you know, just do all of these yards. And then, you know, as you kind of grow and adapt and change and learn yourself and learn your stroke a little bit better, you realize that you might be able to get away with doing a little bit less and it might be more beneficial for your body, but, um, yeah, definitely a learning curve. Yeah. And so, I mean, you mentioned, you know, doing things for the team in college earlier, we were talking about how fun, you know, a team environment can be you're in a you're you're a unique story where you're a professional swimmer now you're on the national team and you swam for a mid-major program in college um did you know a, a lot of people in that situation swim for bigger programs who might have like pro groups or like you know other people who are kind of in that same boat did that make that decision to keep swimming after you were done with college, did that impact it at all? Knowing that you would have to do a lot more stuff on your own. Um, do you know, I didn't really, I didn't really think about it. I didn't make the national team until the summer after I graduated anyway. Um, mm -hmm. so I had just, I wanted to keep swimming through the summer because I loved it, but it was never like, it was never like a plan of mine to make the national team or to be a pro athlete. Um, it kind of, I mean, I'm thankful that it happened, but it wasn't something I was, you know, it wasn't a goal of mine because I didn't know if it was a possibility. I didn't know if I was capable of it. Um, so definitely didn't change anything. Definitely. It, it made it a little bit harder in the beginning, just because I, you know, like you said, I, I would have to do things alone or I would have to turn with a club team, which I'm fine with. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not your normal situation, but, um, uh, I wouldn't change it. I mean, I, I think, 
it's done me really well. So I'm happy with it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about it? Like just at first when you did decide to keep swimming, some of those challenges you did face of just having to do things on your own. Yeah. So, um, yeah, after I made the national team for the first time, I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm excited because I want to keep swimming, but I didn't know if I'd be able to. So that was, um, like a reason to keep swimming. Uh, but I was actually going into my final semester at UMBC. Um, I had to student teach cause I got a certificate in early childhood education. So that next semester I was like a full-time student teacher. So training for the first semester of my being on the national team was very strange. I had to be at school at 7.30 in the morning um, until three in the afternoon, a minimum of three in the afternoon because I was student teaching in a preschool, I mean, a a kindergarten classroom and I had to set everything up because they're babies and they can't figure anything out on their own right away. Um, So I would, my college coach, God bless him, um, Chris said that he would, you know, help me train and he would, be there for me, whatever I needed. So he and I would go to the pool um, from like 5.30 to 7 in the mornings. And then I would have my lunch packed and a breakfast packed and I would drive myself straight to school and I would be in the classroom all day. Um, and With then wet hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, seriously, with wet hair and a huge lunch. The other teachers were Such like, a "Why are you thing. eating so much?" <laughs> I'm like, it's such a hard practice this morning. <laughs> um, but and then depending on like how I was feeling or how much work I had to do, I might double in the afternoon. I would say I was not on a consistent doubling schedule. I did not double often just because I was so exhausted and there was so much to do. Um, but then I, we did that for a while. Sometimes instead of going to the morning practice, I would swim with the, the, the club team in the afternoon at four from four to six. Um, so kind of that, I kind of enjoyed a little bit more just cause I wasn't on my own. Um, and even though I, you know, I was so thankful and loved training with my coach, it was sometimes nice to have some people to swim with. Um, so it definitely got used to it. And then once I finished the student teaching, um, the plan was always to move back home. So I came back home to New York, um, and I just, you know, popped right back into my club team and, and kind of figured it out that way. I started a new lifting program, um, and, you know, just made a few adjustments, but try to keep everything pretty, pretty similar to what I had been doing in college. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds like a hard semester. (laughs) It was so, it was so weird. I mean, I would surprisingly, neither my coach or I ever missed a practice. So neither of us slept through our alarm at four because my alarm would go off at like 440. And yeah. some surprisingly, neither of us slept through the alarm and we were able to make it, um, pretty almost every morning. So it was an experience for sure. Yeah. Uh, well that's congrats on making it through that. <laughs> I'm finishing that. Yeah. That's, that's the real, that's the real accomplishment. Waking so up the, at 440. Seriously. I, yeah. Uh, so, and so then um going back to isl you know you have all these different teammates like you said from all over the globe um while you were practicing with them did you pick up anything even if it was just oh we did this set one day that i really liked or if it's you know they're doing these stretches and now i do those stretches or you know did you pick up anything um specific in a routine or in a practice from from those teammates that, you know, are at your level of professionalism and athleticism that you've taken back with you? Yeah. Um, there were definitely a few drills that I learned while I was there that I've tried to incorporate, you know, into practices, um, some warm up routines that I, you know, took bits and pieces from, um, and converted and tried to make it my own. Um, but I, I, I actually had a lot of fun cause I, like I said, I don't like training alone because I'm so used to it. So while I was there, I tried to just kind of pop in with everybody else. <laughs> I would just look at the practices and figure out which was best for me or what I thought I could accomplish and go from there. But um, I remember there was this one day that, so we had a couple of Hungarians on our team. Um, Bogi, she's a butterflyer and um, we had an IMR. World champion in the tuna yeah. fly. <laughs> yeah. 
So crazy things they do. They do crazy things. One day, <laughs> me and my and Sarah Vasey, who's another breaststroker, we're doing um we're doing like a sprint breaststroke practice, just the two of us having a great old time. And it's long course, and we keep looking over. And these Hungarians just seem to be doing like nonstop butterfly, like just straight. We, every time we touched the wall, we'd look over and they were still swimming fly. And we were both like, what, what are they doing? Oh, maybe they're doing like fifties and we're just missing it. So at the end of the practice, I'm asking Bogey, I'm like, Bogey, what did you guys do? She goes, Oh, we did six, four hundreds butterfly <laughs> long course, four hundreds <laughs> butterfly long course. Sarah and I like, like physically and literally could not comprehend what like the, even like imagine like being able to do one 400 butterfly short course yards, let alone like long course. And so it was after that. And I was like, wow, you guys are, you guys are intense. You do some pretty crazy things. And she was, I was like, was it awful? She was like, no, we kind of do stuff like that all the time. And so again, Sarah and I were like, what do you mean? She was like, oh, I had to do an 800 butterfly long course ones, just crazy things like that. So I definitely, um, it was definitely interesting to watch the different practices. We had another guy um, from Russia who would do backstroke. He was a backstroker and he would just do 60% of his practice would be like underwater dolphin kicks. He would just be, he'd be the first one in the pool and immediately he'd be swimming 25s on his back underwater. Um, and so just like trying to pop into different people's practices and get some um, different, different approaches was a lot of fun. I mean, it took a toll on me, but it was a lot of fun. I never did, you know, anything over a hundred butterfly, but it was still fun to watch. Yeah. I was going to say, so moral of the story, you're doing 400 butterfly in practice. Definitely now, right? not. I, couldn't, <laughs> I physically don't think I would be able to do a 400 butterfly. I don't, too, I have no idea much. how they did that. It was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Um, again, one of the benefits of ISL, just yeah. getting, getting to see what everyone does and the crazy stuff that makes people really fast. Yeah, no, it's so, but it, like I said, it's, I mean, and then we have people on our team that just sprint or, um, you know, Marco cock is a breaststroker as well. And so I, you know, he is amazing and I love him and he kind of like took me under his wing and he helped me with my pullout so much. And, um, just like watching him, he knows exactly what he needs and he's so confident in that. And he knows what he needs to do and he knows how he needs to prepare himself. And he doesn't second guess himself, even though he does things very differently from a lot of us. Um, so just like watching all the different types of techniques and practice, practice schedules and practice ethics, and just being confident in what you need to do, I think is the biggest thing. So, um, definitely adjustments that could have been made that were made for me once I got back, like I said, but, um, it was a really cool learning experience from all different points of view. I feel like I, I talked to Marco in the last couple months and it's he's a super interesting I guy. Yeah. I mean, awesome. I mean, he's, he, and like you said, he, he's been doing it for so long. He just knows what he needs. He knows his stuff. Uh, I talked to, Another Arno Kaminga, who's who's a Dutch breaststroker, and it's like those are those are. Two, it seems like breaststrokers <clears throat> are just kind of a different breed, but also they're so breaststroke is so individual that you just kind of have to hone in on yourself and just kind of learn. Okay, this is this is how this is what's going to work for me. This is how I'm going to do it. Like Arno doesn't warm up at meets like he doesn't get in the pool like <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> he 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 has like an hour long dry land like yeah. routine warm up routine on land that he does but he he warms That's down cool. but he doesn't warm up ever and some you know? people don't need to i know like madison kennedy is like that sometimes she was at the meet this weekend and for the 50 she was like no i don't warm up and she's like i just wet my hair so everybody thinks i warm up <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I was like, how, you know, but Marco's similar, you know, he would, and I remember being on the breakers with him last year as well. You know, I'd go through my 15, 1500 warm up, like with distinctive kicks and drills and pace and everything. And he like hops in and hops out in a 500 and goes to put a suit on. I'm like, are you, are you ready to go? And he's like, Emily, it's a warm up. 
And the point is to warm your body up and that's it. And I was like, Oh shit. Right. <laughs> like, am I doing too much? And then I kind of adjusted and I did, and I learned from it. Um, and now I, you know, do around 1200 instead of 1500, <laughs> depending on the thing. Nice. But he also like, he would ride a bike too. He would like get on the bike and ride first to, you know, get his heart rate up and get his blood flowing. Um, and I mean, I would rather swim than ride on a bike. So that's difference of opinion, but it, I mean, just knowing what you have to do and being confident in it, I think is like half the battle. Definitely. I mean, that makes a lot of sense too. Just if, if you believe in what you're doing, probably going to work. Yeah, no, it's all mental, which is so crazy, but it really is. It's all about mindset and it's all mental and confidence and, you know, just believing in yourself and believing in, in the work that you've put in and knowing that you've done all you can, even if, you know, you could have done a couple hundred more yards one day or like, it's, it doesn't matter. It's just what, what you think that you do and what you do in the moment that makes a difference, I think. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, Emily, I, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me for a bit. Any parting thoughts before we sign off today? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I'm excited. Hopefully we're all, or getting there, we're getting back to racing and everything kind of resumes some normalcy and hopefully we'll be able to do more of these. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.